Venus is the world next door. It's a planet with a radius just 5% less than that of the Earth, and likely forged with the same building blocks as that of our own home planet. If you walked along the surface, the gravity would be comfortably similar at 0.9 g, and with its near circular orbit around the Sun, just 28% closer than we are, it truly seems like our planetary sibling. A beautiful, shining light in our morning and evening skies, so close that it feels like we could just reach out and touch it. And yet somehow, something terrible happened here. Something so transformative that Venus is now a nightmarish hostile landscape. With a surface temperature of over 460 degrees Celsius or 860 degrees Fahrenheit, it's sufficient to melt lead or even zinc. The atmospheric pressure is a frightening 92 times that of Earth's surface, enough to crush a nuclear submarine. It's a desiccated, dry wasteland, with barely a hint of residual water vapor in its atmosphere. Even the stars are lost to this world due to a thick veil of poisonous sulfuric acid clouds. It is a merciless, perilous, toxic planet that is so murderous to our soft primate bodies that the idea of human visitation seems unthinkable. There is evil there that does not sleep. It is a barren wasteland, riddled with fire and ash and dust. The very air you breathe is a poisonous fume. Not with 10,000 men could you do this. It is folly. The full story of Venus may be forever lost to us, such as the unidirectional nature of time, but we have been trying to stitch together what few clues we have to try and better understand what likely transpired. As we discover more and more Earth-sized planets around other stars, we increasingly wonder, are we revealing Earth or Venus analogues? How could you tell the difference? And what exactly triggers one outcome versus the other? In a way, we're incredibly lucky to have a planet like Venus so close by. The universe has given us a gift, an opportunity to study a similar yet tormented version of our own home planet using in situ measurements. A chance to figure out what went wrong and why. Venus has been a mystery to us for so very long. Its surface is totally veiled to visible light due to its thick cloud cover giving us a hall pass to freely speculate about its nature without concern. Author Stephen Gillard once described it as a cosmic Rorschach test, often imagined as a warm, jungle-like world, a fetid swampland inhabited by lizard beings and monsters. Nobody really imagined how much worse it truly was when NASA's Mariner 2 probe made the first successful visit to Venus in 1962 and then reported the staggering temperatures and pressures that we all now know. A colleague of mine, Francois Faget, once said that if we did not have a Venus in our solar system, we would not dare to imagine it. I can't help but feel like the universe is trying to deliberately tell us something by giving us this world, a dark lesson that we would have otherwise never dreamed. Between 1961 and 65, the Soviet Union made a remarkable 11 failed attempts to get a mission of their own to Venus, but what they lacked in fortune, they made up for in perseverance. From 1967 up to the breakup of the Soviet Union, 15 largely successful Soviet missions helped transform our understanding of this mysterious planet. 10 of these achieved soft landings on the surface, although unfortunately, only four of them had cameras and thus now, we only have six images of the Venusian surface ever taken. Six photos, that's it, and only four of those are in color. The images are yellowed from the thick atmospheric haze and reveal what appears to be like cracked volcanic bedrock. Sadly, each lander quickly suffered under the extreme surface conditions, with the record holder being Venera 13, which lasted for a paltry 127 minutes. However, that was 40 years ago, and in that time, technology has greatly improved, so maybe we could last longer now. At NASA Glenn, where they have the world's largest Venus simulation chamber, it is thought that a modern lander could survive weeks or even months. 
possibly even functioning driving across the surface during this time. I, for one, would sorely love to see new high resolution images, sounds and videos from this most mysterious of worlds. The missions thus far have taught us a lot though. We have sampled the atmosphere with the scent probes, we've imaged the surface with radar to penetrate through the clouds, and we've performed high resolution imaging of the upper atmosphere at a range of wavelengths. What has been revealed is a world that is both paradoxically similar and alien to that of our own. Before we get into that, let me just take a moment to thank the wonderful sponsor of today's video, that is Incogni.com. If you think that Venus is a hellish place, the internet has sadly become equally awful, littered with companies harvesting and aggregating your personal data without your consent. I'm talking phone numbers, home addresses, employment history, and even social security numbers. Incogni is a subscription service that I've been using that fights back for you, scanning public databases for your personal information and then persistently requesting that information be deleted until they comply with the law. Log in to the Incogni home screen and you can see just how many databases are harvesting your personal information and the progress of each of these deletion requests. My phone used to ring off the hook with scam calls to such a degree that I basically gave up answering the phone. In another case, a complete stranger called me up at my office and read out to me my home address. I don't know about you, but I am sick of this crap and we really shouldn't have to put up with this. If you want to fight back against this too, then head to incogni.com slash cool worlds to get an exclusive 60% off their annual plan. Once again, that's incogni.com slash cool worlds. Venus might be a nightmare, but your privacy shouldn't be. Now, back to the video. Let's start with volcanism. Like our own home planet, volcanism appears to be a common feature on the planet Venus. Radar imaging has revealed thousands of volcanoes scattered across the surface. Many familiar looking shield and composite style volcanoes, but also many strange pancake shaped volcanoes. These pancakes are about 25 kilometers across and two kilometers tall, with their domed shape implying the eruption of highly viscous lava, almost like honey, that spread out evenly in all directions. We also see corona, such as this one here, nicknamed Miss Piggy, these are cases where magma doesn't quite break through the surface, but instead pushes up against the crust, lifting and bulging against the surface. The convection of magma beneath the crust can also push and stretch the surface, forming linear stretch marks and ridges tens of kilometers across, such as those shown here. However, a difference with the Earth is that these volcanoes are haphazardly distributed across the surface. On Earth, volcanism tends to be concentrated along the boundaries between tectonic plates, especially mid-ocean ridges, but here the distribution implies no such boundaries. This has led to the prevailing theory that Venus indeed has some kind of low-level geological activity, but rather than having its surface fractured up into a series of plates like that of the Earth, here instead we have a single, monolithic and stagnant lid. The other major evidence we have for active geology comes from the study of Venusian cratering. First, it has to be noted that impacts smaller than a kilometer appear to rarely penetrate their way through the thick atmosphere and presumably must burn up on their way down. Nevertheless, we should still expect to see plenty of large craters on the Venusian surface. However, unlike say Mercury or the Moon, geologically dead worlds are washed with craters as far as you can see, here we have a much more pristine surface. The observed number of craters can be used to crudely estimate the age of the surface to be around 0.3 to 1.0 billion years old, and this appears to be true across the entire planet. This has led many to hypothesize that some kind of global resurfacing event must have occurred in her past. Now, whilst we might naively assume this to be just a single bad day for Venus, it could equally have been an episodic series of events during this period. What exactly happened here has been the subject of great debate, especially in the context of the implied stagnant lid. One possibility is that as heat from the core makes its way through the mantle, the stagnant lid prevents that heat from efficiently escaping, and so energy builds up and up until eventually we have a catastrophic episode of global volcanism. 
As if Venus couldn't be any worse of a place to live on, this would make Mount Doom look like a day spa. The resurfacing event makes our challenge of trying to reveal Venus's past even harder, since any geological evidence is wiped clean during such an event. Perhaps the only clues left to us about Venus's ancient past are not found within the ground, but rather are found within the air. So what do we know here? Venus's atmosphere is 96.5% carbon dioxide, which of course is what leads to its extreme greenhouse effect. In fact, if you calculate the expected temperature of Venus without an atmosphere, you'd get something like 328 Kelvin, but the greenhouse effect bumps this up to a hair-raising 737 Kelvin. Now at 92 bars, which means 92 times Earth's atmospheric pressure, there is an awful lot of carbon dioxide in the Venusian atmosphere. In fact, if you calculate it all up, you end up with a staggering 480 million gigatons of the stuff. Whereas for Earth's atmosphere, it's only about 3200 gigatons. So what gives? If these planets were born so similarly, where did all of this carbon dioxide come from? Almost certainly, it was from outgassing, which means that the planet belched it out during volcanism. The Earth too is doing this, but unlike Venus, our carbon is being constantly drawn back down out of the air via photosynthetic organisms which then die, fossilize, and eventually subduct back into the mantle. If it wasn't for these processes, we would probably find ourselves in a similar situation to Venus, since our surficial reservoir of CO2 is actually estimated to be similar to that of the modern Venusian atmosphere. Look, in case it somehow wasn't clear already, burning carbon stores of oil and coal is not a good idea. Now, along with CO2, Venus's atmosphere also contains nitrogen, just like the Earth does. But here, it comprises just 3% of the atmosphere versus 78% for us. But even 3% of such a thick, dense atmosphere adds up to a lot. And in fact, it adds up to a comparable amount to that of the modern Earth in an absolute sense. So Venus really did seem to start out with the same basic inventory of stuff as we did. And yet, somehow the story must have diverged from that of our own. Now, in what I've described thus far, there is a paradox. Venus seems to have a stagnant lid. And whilst that means that yes, it could be volcanically active, it must be far less active than that of the Earth. And that means less outgassing. Yet somehow, it managed to accumulate an impressive 92 bars of CO2 over its lifetime, which is actually pretty difficult to achieve. In fact, recent modeling by Weller and colleagues show that it's kind of impossible for Venus to ever outgas this much CO2 if it had a stagnant lid the whole time. Instead, they propose that Venus must have had active plate tectonics at some point in its past, which then shut off and the planet transitioned to this stagnant lid modus operandi. Taking the modern Venusian levels of nitrogen, CO2, and surface pressure, they estimate that this transition occurred when Venus had an age of somewhere between 0.1 to 2.4 giga years old, whereas today it's of course 4.5 giga years old. That's admittedly a pretty big window, but it means that some kind of transformative event did indeed occur in Venus's past, and one that predates the global resurfacing event from roughly half a billion years ago. The atmosphere contains further clues about Venus's past too, Precise measurements by the Venera and Vega probes, and especially NASA's Pioneer Orbiter, reveal the peculiar observation that the Venusian atmosphere appears heavily enriched in deuterium. Deuterium is a heavier isotope of hydrogen, so you find it in anything containing hydrogen, most notably within water, H2O. On Earth, deuterium is pretty rare. Only 3 out of every 20,000 hydrogen atoms are deuterium. But on Venus, it's 120 times greater, which is weird. The most likely explanation is water loss. Water vapor in the atmosphere is frequently bombarded with ultraviolet radiation that splits or dissociates water into hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen is sufficiently light that it can actually escape Earth's gravity and then is lost forever. Deuterated water also does the same thing, but of course, the deuterium being twice as heavy is far less likely to escape into space. So if a planet has boiled off all of its oceans, that should yield an enhanced D to H ratio over time. 
Now, reverse engineering just quite how much water Venus must have once had is very challenging, but estimates vary from somewhere between 0.3% of that of Earth's oceans all the way up to something that of the modern Earth. What we know for sure is that this process must have happened prior to the global resurfacing event, since we see no hints of water sculpted topography. It's interesting to speculate that this water loss could have precipitated the transition from plate tectonics to a stagnant lid, as water helps reduce the stiffness of plates, making them more plastic and malleable. Is this water loss surprising? Perhaps not. I mean, the simple fact that Venus is closer to the Sun than we are means it receives about double the insulation that we do, which is the flux striking the top of the atmosphere. However, three facts complicate this simple narrative and could perhaps keep an early Venus hospitable. First, the Sun itself is slowly increasing luminosity due to the gradual core contraction. This means that three billion years ago, Venus would have been far less irradiated, just 40% more than the modern Earth. Second, modern Venus is of course incredibly cloudy, which means it reflects 70% of incident sunlight back into space, versus Earth's much darker 30%. Finally, Venus has a remarkably slow rotation rate, spinning backwards relative to its orbit once every 243 days, that's even longer than its year. This again implies yet another cataclysm in Venus's past, most likely some kind of impact that struck the planet and slowed down its spin. However, that blow might have come with an upside. Although, let me note that more recent work has suggested that this could also be explained by tidal interactions with the Sun, complicated by Venus's ultra-dense atmosphere. In any case, climate modeling of Earth-like planets has revealed that slower rotating planets generally stay cooler, as a result of cloud buildup on the sunlit side. Put these three facts together, and perhaps there is still some hope for Venus having once been habitable. Michael Wayne and his colleagues made waves in 2016 when they did just this, and showed that Venus could indeed sustain stable liquid water for billions of years, possibly as late as the last resurfacing event. However, it should be noted that Way assumes one bar of nitrogen atmosphere for ancient Venus, with only trace amounts of carbon dioxide and methane. Now if Venus was like this until a billion years ago, then it becomes trickier to reconcile with the 92 bars of modern CO2 that have somehow outgassed in that time, all whilst being dominated by a stagnant lid. Perhaps this global resurfacing event was cataclysmic enough that it was able to dump out this huge volume of CO2 in short order, but maybe we are just clutching for straws here. So personally, I'm a little bit doubtful that Venus was truly habitable quite this recently, but the excess deuterium certainly does indicate that at least a shallow ocean did exist on Venus at some point in its past. It's interesting to ponder. What would be the fate of Venusian life if it did start there billions of years ago? Could life have adapted to the changing Venusian conditions fast enough to possibly even still be there today? In 2020, scientific headlines were made when Jane Greaves and colleagues reported the detection of phosphine in the Venusian atmosphere. This is a molecule that's produced by anoxic bacteria here on Earth, and Interestingly, there is no known non-biological pathway for its production under Venusian conditions. Yet more, the molecule is unstable. Ultraviolet radiation should break it apart in short order, which means something must be making it. Have we just discovered life? We discussed this story at length here on this channel, and it remains as controversial now as it was then. A series of papers have gone back and forth analyzing and reanalyzing each other's data with claims and rebuttals of the phosphine detection. Perhaps we'll go through all the drama another day, but for now suffice to say that the jury is still out. The data is being pushed to its very limits here, and if there is phosphine there, it certainly appears to be much less than that originally claimed. Fortunately, future Venus missions such as Da Vinci promise to give us much better data and finally settle this debate. Even if confirmed, there will still be questions remaining though, since Truong and colleagues have suggested simple volcanism could plausibly explain the phosphine as well. If something is living on Venus, a basic question is how? The surface conditions here are so extreme that even carbon chemistry is not stable. 
One possible solution is to not live on the surface though, but instead live in the clouds. Between about 50 to 60 kilometers altitude, the temperature is consistent with Earth-like conditions and the pressure is similar too. Indeed, one could imagine a bubble filled with Earth-like atmosphere here as a future outpost for humanity, as it would be naturally buoyant in the dense CO2 air. But unfortunately, this habitable altitude would place you right in the middle of sulfuric acid clouds, which pose an additional challenge for life. The most basic issue here is water. All life on Earth requires water in order to survive, and if this is true for Venusian life as well, then there's a big problem, because what little water vapor there is finds itself intermixed with sulfuric acid concentrations somewhere between 75 and 95 percent. This greatly diminishes what is known as the water activity, which you can think of as sort of how accessible water is from a given medium. Pure water has an activity of 1, and saturated brine has an activity of about 0.75. Even in pure brine, life on Earth can keep going, but it is thought that the limit is about 0.6 for all known organisms. However, in the Venusian clouds, the water activity would be below 0.1, making it really difficult to imagine what could plausibly survive here. Yet more, crucial biochemical compounds are simply unstable in sulfuric acid, things such as proteins, DNA, lipids, and carbohydrates. Perhaps life has adapted to coat itself with some sort of sulfur shell to protect itself against being fully enveloped by sulfuric acid droplets. But even so, water-based life will still desperately struggle to survive. For context, the conditions here are 50 times drier than the driest place on Earth the Atacama Desert on a summer's midday. Venus is a puzzle, wrapped inside an enigma, housed inside a world. There's so much we don't know about its surface, its atmosphere, and especially its past. Whilst Venus has been shunned a little bit in preference for Mars missions by NASA, the tide may now be turning, with three new missions slated to be visiting Venus in the next decade or two. Veritas will orbit Venus with high-resolution X-ray radar, promising 30-meter spatial resolution maps, as well as mapping the gravity field and thermal emissivity, a geologist's dream. Da Vinci is another NASA mission that plans to probe the atmosphere, using a descent probe to precisely sample the chemical composition and isotope ratios, as well as collect high-resolution landscape photos during its descent. And it's not just NASA, ESA is also getting in on the act with Envision, an orbiter that will perform imaging, polarimetry, radiometry, and spectroscopy of the surface, as well as subsurface sounding and gravity mapping. Maybe I'm being a little bit selfish here, but for me, Da Vinci is the mission that I most want to see happen, to categorically resolve the phosphine debate and to provide us beautiful photos of the enigmatic Venusian surface. It's sometimes said that Venus is the endpoint of all Earth-like planets. As stars gradually grow in luminosity, all habitable planets will eventually be pushed into a runaway greenhouse state. The oceans evaporate, and that leads to more greenhouse warming, and soon, the whole gig is over. When we look at Venus, we're not just looking at a world gone wrong, we're looking at our future. It's poignant then to ponder just how many Venuses might be out there. Billions upon billions of dry, desolate hellholes. There may have been countless numbers of biospheres, organisms, even civilizations that were effectively annihilated by their planet's transformation from a once beautiful hospitable state into a twisted, tormented condition. All of those stories lost, hidden under the thick atmospheres, or even worse, completely erased by volcanic outflows as if they never existed at all. Venus is a haunting world. I find it both terrifying and beautiful, a lesson and a warning, alive and dead. But the truth is that if we are ever going to understand the abundance and the fate of life in the universe, we are going to have to venture to Venus. It's almost as if the cosmos herself has given us this world as a gift, whispering in our ear, Go to Venus, but do so with caution. Perhaps I'll see you there.
Thank you so much for watching this video, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to like, share, subscribe, all the YouTube things. It really does make a difference. And if you really want to help us out, you can become a donor to my research team, the Cool Worlds Lab, right here at Columbia University, just like our latest supporter as Xinyu Yao. Thank you so much for your support, Xinyu. Until next time, guys, stay safe and see you out there.